and uh, and we're going to see connections that 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 uh, of language models that maybe you did not quite expect or anticipate, but they are very real. And to start with, we are very lucky to have Stephen Pantadossi. Uh, he is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at UC Berkeley, and uh, uh, a friend of of AI. We we actually have a, a grant together, and uh, and 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 you know. A lot of us in AI are excited and interested in, you know, learning from the psychologists and seeing kind of how they can inspire our work. Well, actually, this is a two-way street, and because the psychologists are also getting excited about the, the language models to understand something about humans, and 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 Stephen uh, will tell us about about some of the work he has been doing, which is I think is very exciting. So, Stephen. Um, so thank you for the invitation to, to speak here. Um, I'm going to be talking about meaning in the age of large language models, or maybe finding meaning in the age of large language models. And this talk isn't a uh, kind of technical talk about language models or evaluation or anything. Um, it's almost uh, closer to philosophy uh, or closer to kind of high-level theories in, in cognitive science and psychology. Uh, which are about meaning um, and some of the kind of history of work of, of people's ideas about uh, where meaning comes from in, in language or in, in semantics and how we can think about those in the context of large language models, in particular in the context of debates about large language models and uh, whether they're just stochastic parrots, right, that, that don't have any form of understanding uh, or whether there's some sense in which they have understanding. And if they do have some form of understanding, uh, if that form of understanding is, is at all related to, to the types of understanding that, uh, that, that people have. So my plan for the talk is first to um, talk about meaning and reference kind of generally. I'll talk about some um, uh, claims in large language models uh, and why people often think that there's no sense of, of meaning or, or kind of real semantics in them. Um, then I'll talk about some uh, uh, psychological theories uh, about meaning and how meaning arises from uh, what are called conceptual roles. Um, I'll come back to large language models and talk a little bit about learning conceptual ro roles um, in large language models or in, in kind of general machine learning systems. Um, and then some a very kind of brief overview of a, of a learning conceptual role experiment um, in people. So let me, let me start uh, with kind of how I got interested in, in this. Um, which was this paper by Bender and Kohler in, in 2020. Right? So Emily Bender is a, a computer scientist um, uh, trained as a, as a linguist also at the University of Washington, uh, who people may know as a, a very vocal critic of, of many aspects of, of large language models. Um, the one that, that initially I think interested me was uh, claims about the meaningfulness of large language models and essentially arguments that uh, there's nothing meaningful at all in, in what uh, statistical models that are trained on text can can do. Um, and uh, Bender and Kohler came up with a very nice way of uh, of making this point, um, what they call the, the octopus test. Um, the octopus test goes as follows. So uh, kind of starting point is for them, meaning is, is an association between a word, say, and something external to language. Okay, so the meaning of the of book is some physical object, a book that's that's out in the world. Uh, you can see that that's right because that's how we label physical objects and when we're learning words, right, we hear the word book when there's books around and we pick up on that association. And so that's kind of fundamentally what the, uh, that, that kind of external reference, right, to, to something in the, in the real world is, is fundamentally what, uh, what the word means. And Bender and Kohler say, okay, let's take that as our, our definition of, of meaning and let's imagine an octopus. So an octopus who lives uh, under the ocean and has tapped into a communication channel, say a, a telephone line, uh, between two islands, okay? So the octopus is there, it's eavesdropping on all of the communication that happens between those two islands, can get a huge amount of, of linguistic input. Um, and you could imagine, very smart octopus, uh, might be able to learn all of the statistical properties of what's happening across that communication channel. Right, might be able to learn, uh, become very good at, at predicting text. Maybe it could predict it optimally, uh, whatever. Um, their argument is, is that uh, the octopus could never actually learn the meanings, right? Because it would never have access to the physical reference, right? So, is this yeah. Any different from the Chinese room? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, interestingly a, a little different from the Chinese room. Um, uh, and maybe can I defer that question to, to the end if, if that's okay? Uh, 
because uh, I think what's going on with the Chinese room might make more sense with, with what, I say, what I say later, okay? But very, very similar in spirit, I would say. Um, so this octopus has, has, uh, has no access to the physical reference and therefore couldn't solve tasks involving the physical objects, right? If you ask them to visually recognize what a coconut was, even if they knew all of the statistical properties of where the word coconut would be used, right? They, they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to solve the, the physical stuff. Okay, and of course, this is the situation that a, a large language model is in, at least one that's only trained on, on text, right? It doesn't get access to stuff from the world. It only has uh, uh, um, kind of text, okay? Uh, therefore, this octopus doesn't have uh, meanings for the words. Um, such an octopus is like a large language model because they only have text. Um, and predictive ability, therefore, can't give you the meanings, right? Meaning is something just fundamentally different than, uh, than predictive ability. Let me give you one other example of this. Well, I'll, I'll just say, like, I, I, I think that on the surface, this is uh, a somewhat convincing argument, right? It's kind of, kind of compelling to, to, to think, of, uh, think of meaning in, in, in this way. And certainly, if you do, it seems, seems pretty convincing. Yeah? And, you know, you're not supposed to have, uh, be told, uh, this, this, this is really referring to this particular interpretation yeah. of that one. Yeah. yeah, great. So uh, hold on to that thought too, because a mathematician thinking about axioms is a, a, a very much related to another version of meaning that, that I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Even, even as Hilbert wanted it to be. Right? Yes. I mean, yes. Hilbert's desire was to convert Euclidean geometry to a set of axioms such that every symbol could be replaced by some arbitrary squiggle, and the system should still work. Right? That is what Hilbert did in the axiom. Metaization of geometry. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I, I think most mathematicians would have a slightly different sense of meaning, um, but but one which which matches what I'll say in a, in a few minutes. So uh, yeah, um, let me give you just a, a, another uh, another kind of gloss on on meaning in, in language models. Here's Gary Marcus talking about lambda. Uh, in truth, literally everything the system says is bullshit. The sooner we realize that Lambda's utterances are bullshit, just games with predictive word tools, and no real meaning, the better off we'll be. Software like Lambda doesn't even try to connect to the world at large, right? That's what he thinks makes it, it bullshit. Uh, just tries to be the best version of autocomplete that it can be. They don't understand language in the sense of relating sentences to the world, uh, uh, but just sequences of words to, to one another, okay? So uh, I got interested in, in, in this uh, in part because I find th this view kind of compelling. Uh, on the other hand, I also think it's, it's kind of deeply wrong. And the, the way in which it's deeply wrong is uh, really interesting for what it has to say about conceptual representations and uh, meanings in, in human minds as, as well as in machine learning models. Um, so uh, um, in uh, a few, few years ago, I teamed up with uh, Felix Hill, who's a, a researcher at DeepMind. Um, and wrote a, uh, an, an article basically uh, going through arguments that meaning is not this form of reference, right? So uh, in fact, this idea that meaning should be equated with some mapping to things in the world uh, has often been rejected by people in linguistics and, and philosophy and, and cognitive science, um, and I think for, for good reason. Um, so just to give you a, a kind of flavor of um, uh, why, why people often reject this, there's many concepts, many words, for example, that uh, have no reference to the external world, right? Function words are a good example of this. Words like to or is or many, right? There's no to, T-O out in the world that that, that word refers to. Um, there's also no is out in the world or, or no many. Um, those are function words in, in language. And uh, what they do is actually much more like uh, kind of what, you know, a, an operator in, in mathematics or something does, right? These words have a, an internal meaning. Um, they control the, the kind of compositional meaning of a sentence, uh, meaning that they have to be composed uh, internally in linguistic representations in order to express their meaning, right? They're not pointing to, to something out in the world. Um, even if you don't go to, to function words like this, there's, there's other words which are uh, very hard to make sense of in, a, in a, a kind of view that meaning is stuff in the world. So you can think of very abstract words like justice, right? There's probably not a justice out there. That's some kind of construct that we have or wit. Uh, or you can think of things that don't exist, like dragons, right? That's, there's no external, external thing in the world, which is a dragon. Um, there's even words and, and concepts we have that have no possible reference to the world, 
right? So if I think about an imaginary bicycle, that's something which is by definition imaginary, right? It's not, it's not out there. Uh, or a perpetual motion machine, right? We can have a concept of a perpetual motion machine and think about it and, and reason about it, but there's certainly not one that, that exists out in the world. Um, even for ordinary concepts, uh, we likely haven't even considered all of the possible things which could be reference of those concepts, right? So uh, I could you know, walk in wearing a shoe made out of eggplants and you could look at them and everybody might agree that they're shoes, right? Uh, but you would agree that they're shoes without ever having seen shoes made of eggplants before, right? So there's some object in the world which everybody would agree is a shoe, uh, even though you've never encountered that thing before. That means that it couldn't have been the stuff in the world which determined whether it was a shoe, right? Had to be some kind of more abstract conception of uh, what makes something a shoe, right? You can think about things like the function or the origin, um, how they're used. Uh, these, these other kinds of properties of, of objects seem to be much more important for the, the categorization of the, the, uh, the concept. Yeah. Well, here this is a little bit of a, like a survivorship bias because, you know, yeah. eggplant shoes might still consider, be considered shoes, but then, you know, ice cream shoes are probably, uh, nobody will recognize <laughs> them as shoes, right? Yeah. And then, but yeah. then you don't think about ice cream shoes. So it's like the things that you can think of as shoes yeah. are you know, in your little bowl, and then you don't think about things that are already too far. So it seems like there is still kind of some distance to the closest real object. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, all, of, all of this is, is not to say that, the, that uh, the, the real objects are irrelevant, right? Like, I agree that eggplants are much more plausible as shoes than, than ice cream. Um, uh, and that has to do with the kind of real physical properties of, of, of those substances. Um, my point is, is just that the physical thing is not the defining thing, right? It's not something in the object you look to to decide whether it's a shoe or not, right? It's, it's something more abstract about how it's used or made or something like that. Um, I actually talk a, a, a bit in this paper about um, uh, the concept of a postage stamp, right? Uh, uh, which is just an example of, of you know, one that, that people probably have some, some intuitions about where um, you, you could easily think of postage stamps which are fundamentally different than any ones you've seen before, right? You could think of one made of glass, for example, or you could think of one that was an RFID tag. Um, there's probably physical incarnations uh, of postage stamps like that that everybody would agree uh, should be called a postage stamp. Um, and if, if you try to get people to define it, right, you might say something like, well, a postage stamp is something you pay for and you put on a letter so that the letter will be delivered by the government or something like that, right? So. Uh, what this, what the term means, right, is is intrinsically connected to a bunch of these other terms like payment and, and letters and being delivered and, and those things. Um, and in fact, if those terms change meaning, right, so if, uh, for example, people develop a new way of paying for things, uh, paying on the blockchain or something, right, then uh, you kind of know automatically that a postage stamp can be paid for in 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 that way, at least in principle, right. So. Uh, it's not just that, that the word is associated with those other things, but it, that its meaning is, is inherently connected to, to those other things. So uh, that's, that's one uh, kind of take on, uh, on why, uh, why reference to stuff out in the world right, is, is not a good way of, of thinking about meaning. Um, let me tell you what one alternative is. Um, actually, before I do that, l let me just um, show a couple of other alternatives, which I think are also not plausible, but might be, might be familiar to people. Okay, so what I just talked about is this kind of world mapping view, right? That there's some word and its meaning is some physical object or, or some thing. Um, can think about other kinds of views of, of concepts and meaning. Um, um, might have a kind of feature spacey kind of view, support vector machines or something, right? There's some abstract feature space and a concept is some dividing line or some region or something in, in this space. Um, uh, that I, I, I think is, is uh, maybe fine in, in some narrow applications, but we'll, what I'll, I'll talk about next are, are cases of, of uh, say human cognition, which really don't fit well in, into that picture in the sense that things are much more complicated for how people think about concepts and, uh, and their relationships. People might also have, have this sort of hierarchy or, or network view, right? So sometimes people think, oh, sorry, you can't see this. There's supposed to be lines <laughs> connecting one concept book in the middle to a bunch of other concepts, right? And um, you might, you know, there's, there's old theories of, say, semantic organization or very old, old AI uh, kind of approaches, right, that um, uh, think about building hierarchies of, of concepts um, uh, or sometimes, you know, networks of, of concepts and trying to define meaning in terms of those relationships. 
I actually think that, that both this and, and the feature and the world, world mapping view um, have some of the some kind of uh, useful properties or useful insights about concepts, but just aren't aren't quite the whole thing uh, for reasons that that I'll I'll talk about uh, next. So um, let me just start with uh, start trying to, to introduce this kind of other view of concepts um, uh, by trying to, to to get people's intuitions on uh, a recent news story. Okay, so here's a, a little recent news from the U.S. versus Trump. Uh, I think this is not the most recent indictment, but one or two indictments ago. Um, uh, if you look through it, you 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 can uh, read all about um, uh, Pence and Trump and, and efforts to to manipulate the election and things. Um, here's a little paraphrase of, of one of the paragraphs, 90C. So Pence, the vice president, right, opposed a Trump team lawsuit arguing that the vice president could reject electoral votes. So so Pence didn't want want them to argue that he could reject electoral votes. He said to Trump that he didn't have constitutional authority and that the action would be improper. This is according to, to Pence's uh, notes at the time. And Trump responded, you're too honest, okay? According to Pence's notes. So think about that situation and everything you, you, you know about this context, right? And uh, think about an answer to a question like, why did Trump say this, right? If you think about that, uh, um, Probably what's going on as you think about it, right, is you're thinking about uh, lots of other things and how they're related to this situation, like what Trump was trying to achieve, maybe what kind of personality Trump had, uh, what you know Trump was trying to do to Pence, is he trying to manipulate him into, into taking some kinds of actions, what exactly that, that action would have, right, in terms of, of the election. Um, everybody is perfectly capable of, of reasoning through these and coming up with, uh, you know, kind of plausible causal story about what's happening, right? It feels like we can come up with our own kind of internal explanations about uh, events like these. Um, and in fact, that process of, of coming up with internal explanations, interrelated uh, kind of concepts and, and meanings um, is one that, that people in developmental psychology have been very interested in and excited about as a, as a theory of uh, kind of human cognition. So um, uh, basic observation is that people form these uh, very richly interconnected systems of, of concepts, right? All of the kind of interconnected stuff you, you, you would need to draw on in order to answer a question like that, uh, which feels totally, totally normal. Um, people sometimes call these intuitive theories, right? You have some intuitive theory of how Trump is acting or how the political system would work or uh, um, some intuitive theory of, of what, you know, Pence might be doing or might be, be trying to achieve. Um, and these things are often compared to, to theories in science, right? So, um, um, uh, you can think of it. You can think of your theory of why Trump might do this as kind of analogous to a little scientific theory, right? It has some pieces. It has some relationships between the pieces. It has some dynamics, um, and maybe you can uh, look at all of that and, and kind of reason about it causally, as you might reason about any other kind of system that that you you've encountered. Um, so the idea that that uh, people and maybe most notably kids do this uh, is one which is is really uh, uh, had been, been very popular in, in cognitive development, um, um, championed maybe most, most prominently by Alison Gopnik, who's a developmental psychologist uh, here at Berkeley. Um, let me just give you a quick example of, of how kids, uh, how, how, how experiments with, with kids like uh, kids uh, sometimes go in, in this domain. So uh, here's a, um, an experiment from Lazot and, and, and Gelman. Uh, so kids are shown these two foxes, right, which you might notice are identical pictures. OK, um, and then they're told things uh, about these foxes and asked what, what they could do in order to, to answer a question. Right. So this is like a simple version of why did Trump say that um, you might be told that one is an animal and one is a toy. OK, what could you do in order to determine which one is an animal and, and which one is a toy? Right. Um, in this experiment, uh, kids will say that you should do things like check the insides, right? Like check their guts or whatever, right? <laughs> Open them up and, and see. Uh, or uh, look at their behavior, right? Um, if it acts like an animal, then, then you could use that to figure out which one, which one is the animal, which one is the toy. Or look at their parents, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the animal will have, will have animal parents and the toy won't, right? Um, and importantly, they don't just say, yeah, you can check everything about these. They know, for example, that age is not relevant, right? So they, they, they won't tell you that, uh, that age would tell you which one is an animal and, and which one is a toy. And it's worth pausing and just thinking about this and, and what this 
means in terms of conceptual representations, right? Because uh, you can think about your concept of what makes something an animal or, or what makes something a toy, and kind of like the postage stamp example, right? It's intrinsically connected to these other things, like what parents are or what's going on with your guts inside, right? Or what your behavior is, right? That concept is just intrinsically linked there. And kids, I think these are preschoolers, um, uh, uh, know that from a, a, a pretty young age. You can also ask them a question like, one is a dog, one is a wolf. What would you do, okay? Um, kids basically say the same things there. You could check the insides, you could look at behavior, you could look at their parents, to see if they had a, a dog parent or, or a wolf parent. Um, some of these are actually kind of interesting, right, because I don't think anybody knows, uh, at least I don't, what, what you would look for on the insides to distinguish a dog versus a wolf, right? Like, um, uh, maybe you could go down to DNA, or, or I'm sure you could go down to, to DNA to tell that, um, but people have the intuition that, like, okay, there's something about being in this category which depends on these other, these other aspects of, of being in the concept. Yeah. Well, to me, I read this much simpler. It's like, it, basically, what they're saying is, look. Right, all of these are visual things. And yeah. it's just that you're trying to project it into language. But actually, what the kids are probably meaning is, well, you know, you will you will know it when you see it and when you, you know, play with it, right? It, 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 a vision yeah. and interaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, age is neither. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think it's true that, that uh, yes, all, all, all of these are, are visual cues. I don't know of experiments that look at non-visual cues. Um, uh, but I agree. Yeah, that's that, that's interesting. I'll give you one one other example though, where where they 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 don't where they 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 know that there's no cue, right? So if you tell them that one is named Amanda and one is ma named Melissa, uh, then they'll reject all of these as tests, right? They'll say, okay, the insides are not going to tell you which one is Amanda. Um, the behavior and the parents and the age and, and these things are are not going to. Okay. So all of this is just to say that um, people have a a uh, even kids right have have pretty sophisticated theories of how concepts relate to other concepts, right? Um, and in fact, in a situation like this, right, there's nothing visual, apparently, that, that could tell you, right? So it's not a visual discrimination task. It's really a kind of conceptual one um, that's asking you to, 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 to look at other kinds of conceptual features and things. Um, so uh, people have these intuitive theories. Um, then one kind of proposal um, quite a few people have, have argued for is that meaning arises from essentially the role that a word or a symbol or a concept plays in this theory, right? Like, like the, the, the meaning of animal is really just intrinsically related to these ways of testing it and these kinds of features and uh, all of the other things that are not kind of simple semantic associates with animal, but um, are uh, kind of deeply connected in, 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 in the sense of an intuitive theory. Um, I was trying to come up with examples where uh, um, uh, this, you know, will give people this, this intuition, right, that, um, uh, you know, if you try to define these words, if you try to define what an indictment is, for example, it's very hard to do it in a way that doesn't reference other legal terms and other kind of social constructs and, and, uh, uh, and concepts that, that you already have. Right, it's kind of intrinsically related to this system of, of other concepts and terms. Right, chord change is kind of like this too in music. Right, you have to talk about chords and notes and and um, uh, circle of fifths or whatever. Right, like these things are just intrinsically related. I think force in physics is is like this. Um, it's very hard to talk about it in in isolation, independent of um, you know experiments or, or other concepts or things. Or if I said like, what does a bobbin do in a sewing machine? <laughs> okay, right, like. You have to talk about thread and you have to talk about the processes of sewing. Just the meaning of these things are, are just all intrinsically linked together. So um, this uh, idea that meaning is not about reference, it's about the role that something plays is called conceptual role theory. Um, meaning of a word or concept is determined by the, the role it, it plays. Um, and um, uh, this uh, has been argued for, um, I think maybe most prominently by Ned Block, who's a, a philosopher of mind, uh, who wrote one of my, my favorite paper titles, uh, Advertisement for Semantics of Psychology, uh, which is basically all about you know, how psychology needs uh, a theory of meaning and a theory of, of semantics. And this idea of conceptual role is, is something that, that can do that. So it can explain kind of where meaning comes from. It can uh, um, address questions of how meaning depends on things like your representations or categories that you know um, can play nicely with compositionality or um, other other aspects of language. Um, and I think maybe most most compellingly can explain how you could find meaning in brains, right? So if you open up a brain and you start recording from from neurons, uh, 
you know, it's really unclear what it means for there to be reference in there, reference to the external world in there. Um, but maybe you could kind of make sense of, of patterns of activity in a way that um, uh, lets you uh, kind of interpret systems of, of signals and, and, and representations. Um, uh, let me give you an, an just one, one other example of this that, that maybe might, might make things uh, more clear. Um, this idea of conceptual role semantics, I think, is, is also how meaning works in, uh, say, a computer. Okay? Also, I think, in, in mathematics, which is why I was deferring the, the questions about, about mathematics. But you could look at something like this. right? This is a, a floating point uh, representation and ask, what makes the bits in this representation mean what they do? Right? In particular, what makes the first bit mean the sign bit? Right? It's nothing about being the first one because there have been do dozens of different conventions for floating point numbers, which put the sign bit in, in all kinds of, of different places. Right? Uh, what makes it mean the sign bit uh, is how it interacts with all of the other operations that you can do with floating point numbers. Right? Uh, so meaning in some sense comes from the interaction between symbols, or in other words, their conceptual role. So in particular, like what does negation do? Right? If I have a, a negation operator, okay, it flips the sign bit. Great. Okay, that's that's uh, that's that's where it gets its meaning from, right? Or what does addition do? Does addition do the right thing with respect to the sign bit, uh, or multiplication, or rounding, uh, or whatever, right? So what makes this the the floating point representation, and what makes that uh, first bit represent sign, uh, is nothing intrinsic in the representation itself. It's how it interacts with all of the other components of the of the system. Okay. Yeah. This way of thinking about semantic sense of compared to the hierarchical approach, where there's concepts and there's sort of subroutines. Yeah. So, um, in a, a, a like, I, I think that um, like there's, there's certainly concepts people have that are hierarchical, right? So we know that dogs are a kind of animal, and animals are a kind of a living thing. Um, I think what what that kind of picture is missing is that our representations are actually you know, like computational objects, like they do something, right? They interact with each other um, and they allow us to solve, you know, certain kinds of inference problems and, and you know, all of the stuff you could do with your concepts like the, the, the Trump example, right? Um, yeah, so the claim is not that they're not hierarchical, right? It's that the, the interesting, important things they do uh, come from interactions kind of internally between concepts, much like the, the, the way that the sign bit is interesting or important here uh, comes from its interactions with things like negation and multiplication. Yeah, yeah. What you're saying here is perfectly good, but what I have yeah. trouble with is buying this as an exclusive theory of semantics. Yeah. Just like... Uh, you, you gave good arguments against the, the that meaning is just reference. Yeah. Okay, I think you demolished that theory, but now you put up another theory, which also I find that it has some good aspects, but yeah. to create, make that an exclusive theory is problematic. So if we look at yeah. children growing up, there are these studies on sort of concreteness judgments. So the vocabulary of a child at two, there are a lot of words in there like milk and bottle and jump and sit and so forth, yeah. which are very concrete, concrete in a visual sense, concrete in a motor program sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the age of 10, they have words like justice and fairness and so forth, which are very much, which fit much better into this conceptual role yeah. story. Yeah. Whereas the vocabulary of a child at two may be one where this kind of groundedness to sensory motor experience is a much better account. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is not problematic for me. Why do we need to have one exclusive theory for uh, meaning? Yeah, Both so I, of these are aspects of, uh, of meaning. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. So I, I, I think that um, uh, you can think of the physical reference, right, as in some sense one of the conceptual roles that something can have, right? It's like, um, it is important. I'm, I'm not sure we know Kind of how abstract kids' early meanings are uh, for, for those kinds of words, right? Because it's not, it has to be a little bit abstract because you'll call a new bottle that you see a bottle still, right? So you have some abstraction away from the examples of bottles that, that, that you've seen. But I, I agree, it feels uh, early on very concrete and, and uh, much less abstract than, than things become later. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, just trying to make sure I understand what this theory is saying. So, is um, is there a correct way to think of this that you're saying that meaning is basically like some homomorphism onto some either intuitive or formal theory? Uh, sure. So then maybe yeah. a follow-up question is like, 
which how do we know which homomorphisms are valid? Because I could always, uh, if I can have some arbitrary correspondence mapping, I could make anything correspond to anything else of what's allowed here. Yeah, so um, I don't think anybody has been that formal. People like uh, Putnam have made this kind of argument about understanding computation in physical systems, basically saying like physical systems, like a brain or in his example, a wall, right, are, are uh, so complicated that I could come up with Kind of any mapping back and forth between the states of it and the states of a kind of arbitrary computational system. Um, and um, that's probably a much longer thing to, to get into. I'll just say that I, I don't think I have a very easy answer about that, right? Um, uh, I think of this as, as not kind of, uh, uh, certainly not formalized in, in, in that sense, but in, in sort of a higher level in terms of, of like what kinds of theories we should be looking for, right? Um, and then there's lots of work to do in, in, in terms of making that precise, uh, so. Yeah. yeah, Quine actually uses that example to motivate this kind of theory in like 1950s philosophy. Sorry, which example? Quine uses this example. Oh, he uses Quine. an example yeah. of Gavagai. You see yeah. something yeah. Yeah. popping out and you're like, how do you know Gavagai means rabbit and not running and not yeah. hole and not something else? Because the real world doesn't determine what a, what a meaning is. Uh, concepts, uh, um, semantics have, have been extensively turned into description models. Is, is, is any of this been operationalized at all? Could you comment on that? Um, I don't think so. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'll, I, I could talk. Uh, um, I have a couple examples of, of uh, kind of learning intuitive theories, um, um, which you know essentially have this this kind of character. So of um, uh, taking data and then trying to come up with some structures that obey the the, the right relations, right? And um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about that, but there, there hasn't been a ton of work on, on that, so, yeah. Um, could you talk about how this theory deals with when the same symbols or words are in different kind of theories or settings? Like, is it, does it kind of mean that the symbols themselves don't have meaning or how are the kind of the meanings shared across different contexts? Yeah, so um, uh, that's a, an interesting question um, that I think people have, have not resolved very well. So, um, uh, you know, your symbol for your father might play a, a bunch of different roles, right? Because you know, you know, what job your father has and you know what family relations and you know um, what hobbies and, and um, uh, I don't think that, that there's, there's good kind of formalized a, a accounts of, of how to make sense of all of that. Um, so there's, there's not great theories of kind of formalizing conceptual roles. Um, um, I'll give some arguments why I think it's plausible that language models are, are doing this at least in a, in a tiny version. <laughs> um, but in terms of like rich and kind of human-like con uh, conceptual roles, I think that's one of the, the key problems that's hard to solve. So yeah. uh, is there another one? Yeah. Of the kind of physical words, people think that we're using right now, for example, is a, a subset of uh, the ontology of uh, human's mind, and probably also a subset of all possible future invented uh, uh, concepts and so on. Sorry, what was what was the? I missed the very first part. What was the question part? So the question is whether you think. Um, the, car, the existing ontology that you are using now is a subset of the ontology of human's mind that we haven't, haven't fully explored. And probably that is also a subset of what kind of can be uh, inventive or creative uh, produced concept by, that you by, mentioned in the beginning. By ontology, do you mean these, these theories? Uh, uh, I mean terms, for example. Terms, yeah. yeah, concepts. You know, yeah, yeah, concepts. I, I mean... Uh, uh, I don't think any of these is quite the right answer, <laughs> right? Like these things are actually very difficult to, to figure out. Um, um, but I think they're kind of pointing in, in some useful directions or something. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah. And if you know the symbols that you're using, why does it matter? Because uh, as long as you define certain meaning, whether you use uh, like uh, words to represent or you find to represent, it doesn't matter, right? Um, in, in terms of which symbols, like uh, mental representations, or yeah, so yeah, so just just to make sure that yeah. you, 
how far do you still have to like do you have any uh i have a little ways to go okay, okay. so <laughs> maybe uh, we should push this toward the after after at the end because it seems like a you know a deeper discussion yeah yeah okay great um uh okay so um, uh, I talked about this, these kinds of uh, accounts of, of meaning, right? Um, uh, particular meaning as, as conceptual role. Um, and let me talk a, a little bit about learning conceptual roles and, and why we might think that's uh, plausible or, or, or useful. Um, uh, seems to me at least that um, large language models almost certainly need to learn some of these pieces of conceptual role. Um, that these kinds of things seem really necessary for the stuff large language models are good at, right? Writing coherent texts or, or doing translations or providing definitions or providing elaborations or explanations, right? All of those things require you to put symbols in the right relationships with other symbols, right? And uh, that means that uh, like to do those things well, you essentially have to have some little components of, of conceptual roles, right? Um, one way to, to think about this is that human meanings or human conceptual roles generated the text, right? So maybe a smart inferential model, right, could invert that and figure out what were the likely conceptual roles that uh, that, that generated the thing that I saw. Um, I like this this Frege quote, right? The structure of sentences serves as an image of the structure of thoughts, right? It's some projection of our of our thoughts or, or our meanings, our conceptual roles that gets realized into into sentences. Yeah. yeah so it, the the which example, sorry? Are you going to recapitulate with that Engelman's two fox example? Or is that a uh, no, I wasn't going to go back to that. Uh, yeah, but I'll 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 talk about a a study in large language models in a minute. Um, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, a lot of people have the intuition this is not possible. I think this is kind of the, the Bender and, and Marcus intuition that our thoughts really get projected into this kind of impoverished sequence of sounds, right? How could you discover something like rich conceptual roles uh, there, right? Uh, if you just have this, this projection of, of language, how could that ever support you know, rich and interesting kinds of, of conceptual roles? Um, uh, we, one kind of way that I think is, is a helpful analogy, although not not kind of a mathematically precise implementation or something. Um, so people may, may know these embedding theorems from, from dynamical systems, which I think are, are, are very cool. Um, there's this paper called Geometry from a, a Time Series, um, uh, which essentially shows that in some cases you can take projections of dynamical systems and recover things which capture the, the structure of the dynamics from that projection. Um, so in particular in this paper, they go through this, which is the, the Rossler attractor. Uh, this is a you know, system of, of uh, three-dimensional system of, of differential equations. Uh, and what you can do is take a, a one-dimensional projection of those dynamics. So you can look at just the X location of, of what's happening there. Um, and through a clever trick, um, uh, essentially translating the, the one dimensions into three dimensions using um, by going uh, backwards in time, some number of, of steps, uh, you can actually recover the structure of this from the one dimensional projection. Okay. Um, and uh, there's other kind of general theorems about when this is possible, Hawkins in embedding theorem and things like that. The, the kind of point here, right, is, is that uh, we shouldn't really have strong intuitions about what's possible from some projection of, of thoughts, right? Because oftentimes there, there's, uh, it might be possible for, for people to, uh, or for, for learning models, to, recon to, to reconstruct kind of interesting parts of uh, of the structure of some system just from simple kind of measurements uh, of that system. Um, actually, Shaw here, the, the senior author, wrote an, uh, an entire book on recovering the, the kind of dynamical properties of a dripping water faucet, <laughs> um, uh, where you can measure the, the time between drips and, and figure out things about the kind of latent variables and latent structures there using techniques that are, that are a lot like these. Um, in psychology, actually, people have, have also been interested in, in uh, kind of closely re related types of models. So there's this work by uh, Roger Shepard in the, in the 80s, uh, which essentially would, would take behavioral judgments and try to infer the underlying structures uh, behind them. So for example, this, uh, this matrix here is uh, different colors, so different wavelengths of light, and then confusability between them on uh, judgment tasks. So just, you know, how similar are these things or how confusable is one color with another? Um, and he, Shepard was, was using multidimensional scaling to, to go from data like this um, up to a, a representation like this, which you might recognize as a color wheel, right? Basically, you can arrange uh, 
arrange points um, so that their distances correspond to the, the distances in the confusion matrix um, and therefore uh, recover something about the kind of underlying, in this case, psychological structure uh, that, that generated that data. Um, people have, have also uh, done similar kinds of things in uh, learning kind of real formalized versions of uh, uh, of theories or of, of intuitive theories. I really like this, this paper uh, by Tomer Ullman and Noah Goodman and, and Josh who's speaking, speaking next on learning a theory of magnetism. So basically you take observations of uh, which objects interact with which other, with, with other objects uh, and uh, do some uh, learning to, to, to acquire a kind of high level theory of you know, the, the fact that there are you know, two different kinds of, of magnetic objects um, and those two different kinds of things will interact with each other, but they won't interact with things that are that are non-magnetic, right? So this is like a little tiny mini intuitive theory that you can acquire just from from very simple, uh, you might think, kind of impoverished data about about interactions. Okay. So when people talk about LLMs just being based on text, um, I think that isn't really enough to to conclude anything about what theories they might induce, right? Or what kinds of internal structures and and conceptual roles they they, they might induce from that text. Um, and in fact, there's some evidence, I think, that uh, um, what they are inducing um, uh, looks pretty plausible, at least in, in kind of simple domains. So um, there's this paper by uh, Grand and, and colleagues, um, which essentially looked at uh, word embedding vectors and projected them onto, uh, say, intuitive dimensions. So here you have a bunch of words. Um, you project them onto this line, which is a line connecting small and large. Okay, so every, all, all of our, our high dimensional word vectors get project, projected onto the small versus large line. And we take that as a way of measuring, you know, how large versus small different, different objects are. Um, and then the question is, you know, is in a model trained only on, on text prediction, uh, is that project, it, do, does that projection uh, recover anything human-like about the underlying conceptual spaces? Um, and they show, yes, it does. So uh, here's six plots where the x-axis is, is the semantic projection, right? So how far on that small to large line something is. And then the y-axis is human ratings of how small versus large an, an object is, right? You can see that the correlations here are not perfect, but they're also not garbage, right? They're uh, actually quite strong, I think, for, for a, a model like this, that things which you know, the model calls wet versus dry or big versus small um, or dangerous versus safe, um, uh, people also uh, agree with, right? So just in predicting text, this thing has recovered these kinds of aspects of semantic structure um, latent in the in the word vector representations. Yeah. But this this is probably sitting there in n-grams, in, in bigrams, in fact, that information, right? It, it, it doesn't oh, have to do anything with be. the real world. Uh, well, it does have something to do with the real world. <laughs> no, it's like a, you know, it's a small, you know, a small and large could just be linguistic constructs and you're testing it on, on language. Oh, I see. You think it's it's that you say small tiger versus large tiger or yeah. something. Or, and, you know, small puppy. Um, and do that. Right. Puppy is always small, tiger is always large. Yeah. So uh, it might be true in n-grams. I'm not sure. I don't think that they that they looked at that. Um, um, I don't think that that... Uh, I don't think that defeats the argument, though, right? Because I, I, I think it, it, it is the case that, you know, even n-gram statistics are, are statistics about word relations, right? Um, so it might be that you don't need fancy language models or something to, to do this. Um, but, but. You're, but you're not actually, like, you don't need real world for this to work. Uh, well, the, the, the real world generated how often you hear small puppy versus large puppy, right? So uh, the, 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 the real world is mirrored in those statistics, and then the, the configuration that system comes up with is also one that mirrors those properties of the real world. I think I, yeah. can I push back on that as well? Yeah. I, I, I do kind of feel like what Elliot is saying is right. That this, yeah. like, this is much closer to n-grams than it is to large language models. And the properties we're seeing are just so much wilder than any of these embedding kind of tricks um, in practice. Oh, you, you mean that large language models are much smarter than this? I, I don't even is see that, how this is yeah. comparable in a way, right? Like this pops out of like just PCA, whereas like we're seeing like these wild emergencies come out of large language. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I, I don't think this explains wild emergent behaviors. I think that this, this was just trying to say that, uh, you know, when you train on text prediction, you configure yourself to align with, with some of the true properties of the world, which are reflected in the text statistics. I see. Uh, okay. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. 
Okay, since I'm short on time, I'll, I'll skip this. I'll just say that there's um, there's other papers looking at uh, transformers um, and uh, kind of how, how they relate to classic studies on, on concepts in, in cognitive science, classic kinds of effects, uh, but I'll, I'll skip that. Um, uh, maybe I'll go very briefly just, just through this, this kind of fun experiment. This is uh, Mark uh, Gorenstein in, in my lab has been um, interested in, in learning uh, concepts just from, from linguistic uh, linguistic experience, maybe linguistic prediction. Um, he's been doing, doing these, these uh, kind of cool experiments where we give people uh, passages of natural language where uh, there's some blanks. So here, uh, here's a passage. The myth of blank is so powerful that the very words conjure up blank of strudel and blank in a cozy Viennese cafe, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the job of, of participants in this is to learn where to put the word Dax. Okay, so Dax is a novel word they've, they've never encountered before. Um, uh, you have to read this and, and understand the context and stuff in order to, uh, to, to figure that out and, and see where DAX should go. Secretly behind the scenes, um, these, uh, this example has been chosen as a, um, just from a big corpus of text of a, of a really rare word that people probably don't know. Okay, so the rare word here is soccer tort. Okay, and that means that, that this uh, language, like where soccer tort actually occurred here, um, uh, was generated from, from real people and presumably reflects the underlying meaning and things of, of soccer tort, okay? Um, I don't even know if I'm saying that, that correctly. Uh, but with examples, with enough examples of these, people will learn where Dax is. They get feedback on whether or not they were correct according to, to whether they chose the place where soccer tort actually, actually appeared, okay? So we're, we're having them do kind of a version of a, of a prediction task um, uh, trying to, to figure out where, where this word goes, uh, but they, they don't actually see the word, they, they see it as, as DAX. Um, people get pretty decent at this, so up, up to 80% or, or, or so, uh, depending on the word. Um, uh, these are just, sorry, these are the examples of, of the words where, which generated the, the unseen context. Um, and after that, we asked them a bunch of questions. So we asked them some reading comprehension, we ask them feature questions about DAX, right? Is DAX a man-made object? Do biologists typically study DAX? Do people use DAX in painting? Uh, just a whole collection of, of kind of basic feature kind of concepty questions. We give them an image recognition task, right? Uh, picking out soccer tort, the, the, the real thing versus, uh, versus alternatives. Um, and we also ask them for explicit definitions, right? These contexts are, are not definitions. They're, they're not saying, here's what a soccer tort is. It's, it's naturalistic usages of the, of the object. Um, and what we find actually is, is within, um, uh, within a, a, about 20 trials or so, um, sorry, everything is, is uh, after 20 trials, uh, people are actually very, very good at judging conceptual features for these, uh, for these concepts. Um, almost at ceiling in, in, in most of the, the kinds of feature questions we, we ask them. Um, here's each, uh, uh, each word on a row and then features here on, on the, the x-axis. Um, almost everything is red, meaning they're, they're, they're good at this. They're also good at, um, at picking um, which picture is the object, right? So they've never encountered any pictures at all, but, but they're 80% um, they're or so good at, at picking these things out. And they're even good at giving definitions for, for these terms. Okay, so here's a uh, dictionary or wiktionary or something definition of, of soccer tort. It's a chocolate cake or tort of Austrian origin invented by Franz Soccer, supposedly in 1832 for some prince in, in Vienna. Um, and people just from these contexts, 20 of them will learn things like it's a chocolate dessert similar to a cake that was originally and most commonly made in Vienna. I think it's a type of chocolate cake that can be ordered for dessert in Austria. Uh, kind of rich chocolate cake from from Vienna and so on. Okay, so so people are are uh, um, pretty good at uh, at uh, taking kind of in context language use and figuring out underlying aspects of of conceptual representation from that. But they will never be able to taste it. I mean, it tastes so good. <laughs> Have you had it? That, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I'd never heard of it. So it's, okay. it's, it's great. Okay, so let, let me just wrap up here. So um, uh, I think of, of these kind of conceptual roles uh, or theories as really both a strength and a weakness of, uh, of at least current large language models. Um, one is, is that large language models, I think, seem very good at learning kind of shallow but, but broad theories, right? So things like, could shoes be made out of eggplants or what would happen if shoes were made out of eggplants, right? They would know, uh, you know, what some bad downsides of, of that kind of thing might be, right? Or um, 
uh, answer you know basic kinds of, of questions that that might rely on um, uh, you know kind of reasoning through one or two kind of links about the the relationships between the objects involved in a in a situation like that. Um, I think it's been very surprising to people that this works uh, this works so well, right? And and uh, part of I think what what makes it surprising is is that um, uh, you know, these, these uh, models are able to be trained on a huge number of words, right? And so sort of superficially knowing a little bit about conceptual roles of a huge number of words seems to, to, to get you pretty far um, um, in terms of seeming convincing and in terms of, of language production. Um, but it's also these conceptual roles and theories are also a weakness and they don't seem very good at robust and precise theories, right? So if you think about conceptual roles like in mathematics, right, how you define, say, a natural number or how you define an integral or something, right? Like all of those are, are uh, symbolic kinds of theories which are uh, precise and which support, you know, chains of reasoning of arbitrary length, right? And that's what these, these systems really seem not to be, uh, not to be very good at. Likely that's because there's some important things which are missing, right? Things like uh, grounding, uh, things like reasoning, or, or even richer, richer kinds of theories. Um, I think Josh will, will talk about this uh, this some um, next. Um, I think that there's a, a uh, kind of broader view of uh, concepts and meanings, which is really, I think, the most exciting for people that, that work on, on concepts and, and uh, concept representations in cognitive psychology. Um, which is that large language models have really shown how vectors can do things that were long thought to be impossible for non-symbolic models, right? In particular, these kinds of arguments from people like Fodor and, and Politian about compositionality and systematicity and productivity, right? All, all of these kinds of things that um, people have pointed to as, as uh, characteristic features of, of thinking and have argued were characteristic features of, of symbolic thinking just turn out not to be right, right? It turns out you can get, you can get vectors to, to do those things. Um, and I would argue that the, that the solution to why vectors can do those things is probably that, that uh, what these models are doing is training vectors that encode conceptual roles, right? Like what they're learning is, is representations of meaning which capture the important parts of, of conceptual roles. This is actually something which has been um, uh, sought, long sought after in say computational neuroscience. Um, there's things like vector symbolic architectures that are, are uh, very exciting ways of, of encoding, say, ar arbitrary symbolic systems or arbitrary mathematical systems um, uh, into vectors. Um, and I think that some marriage of, of those two things is, is uh, uh, going to be very exciting. Um, uh, so large language models point to a theory of meaning that's, that's based on uh, essentially vector-based conceptual roles, right? And perhaps can capture a lot of the different features of, of meaning that uh, um, people in, say, cognitive science or cognitive development um, uh, have tried to kind of bring out in human conceptual systems, right? Like that our meanings are gradient or that they have hierarchies, um, that we know things like definitions and we can make inferences about relationships and similarities. And all of those things seem, um, seem like things that you can encode, at least in principle, in, in vectors, um, uh, which is great. Um, so... Um, uh, I'll skip that. Let me just end there. Um, I'll thank you again for the invitation and thanks also to all of my, my co-authors on uh, the work here. All right. Yes. Um, um, may, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but, but uh, it seemed to me that you hinted at um, uh, what these vector representations and uh, large language models tell us about both uh, human cognition as well as about language, the nature of language. Yeah. Uh, could I ask you to do a projective measurement and come out and say uh, something about that? <laughs> um, I think that uh, they tell us that that uh, vectors are, are really plausible. They kind of show us how vectors are, are plausible for meanings, right? And um, the way in which I think that they're plausible for meanings is that they encode conceptual roles. Um, uh, that's what I would say. And I, I think until them, until kind of recent deep learning, I think it was really unclear, right? So people had argued for decades about whether, you know, the foundation of concepts was definitions or is it like somehow similarities or is it that you just know a word and you know a bunch of associated features or, or, or whatever, right? Um, and I, I think one of the, um, the main insights, for example, is, is, is that 
uh, you can extract a definition from a large language model. We've even given it some of these kind of human experiments we've done, and, and they're, they're, they're pretty good at coming up with the chocolate tort kind of definitions from those. Um, and that tells you that the definitions can be encoded into, into vectors, right? And that's great, right? That, 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 that means that uh, you don't need to think about definitions as the defining part of, of concepts, right? There's some other kind of more abstract, um, you know, high dimensional space or, or whatever that, that defines the meanings. And the sense in which it defines the meanings is in terms of the relationships between vectors on the tasks that you use the concepts for. Um, is yeah. it just natural since the brain encodes information with lots of neurons yeah. firing through your brain? This should not be surprising. So it's not surprising. It's um, uh, It was always unclear how that was even possible. So uh, yeah. Kind of see the mechanism or the yeah, mechanism. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's like everybody always kind of knew that there had to be a continuous system which could support these things. But when you look at, you know, the discreteness in language or this discreteness in mathematics, it was always kind of unclear where that could come from. Um, so that's why I think things like vector symbolic architectures are, are very exciting, too. Um, so, so yeah. when a human fills in the meaning, they're using a lot of context that they've gotten from the real world. Yeah. When an octopus tries to fill in the meaning, they have much less context to work with. Yeah. And when a LLM fills in the meaning, they have no kind of context. Work with. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had thoughts about the differences. And that, that yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting, interesting to think of, of what's exactly happening in that human experiment, because I agree it's transfer of stuff, you know, like you've encountered cakes and you've encountered fancy pastries or, or, or whatever. And uh, um, part of what you know about those meanings are the grounded parts, right? You know what a cake looks like, which is why you can you can recognize the the, the pictures and, and things. Um, I always have a little bit of trouble thinking about it because it's not never quite clear to me exactly what it means to transfer something grounded. Like it feels a little bit like in order for it to transfer at all, it has to be a little bit abstract. Um, um, but I agree that that's that's the right question to ask, and and we we don't have any theories or certainly no no evidence about. Um, you know, how exactly people solve that problem or, or the, the way in which it relies on conceptual roles versus grounded experience or something. So. Okay, so we'll have one more question. Meanwhile, maybe we can have the next speakers uh, start setting up. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Steve, for the great talk. Um, I wanted to understand better what the argument was in this kind of uh, conceptual embedding experiment, because it seems like you could just ask the LLM what whether it's tall or not, like you didn't really need to do this projection to know that it can do this task. So is it somehow, is there something special about the fact that you're looking at embeddings rather than the outputs or what's kind of going on there? Um, that's a good question. So I, I, I think you probably could do that. I, I, I don't know how, I don't know how the results would compare um, if you just asked versus not. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I, I think it's like, if it doesn't succeed on just asking, then it's interesting to know whether it's it's kind of latent representation still has that information or not. So, um, uh, but I, I I don't know the, the whole space of kind of how you how you can interrogate these these models for those questions. So, all right, let's uh, let's thank uh, Stephen again. Um, we'll we'll have plenty of time to to talk to him more at. Um, at the uh, uh, refreshments after this talk, and who knows, maybe there will be Zafar tortoise there, uh, which is, by the way, amazing. If you're in Vienna, you should absolutely try it. Um, so, unfortunately, the next speaker could not be here. Josh Tenenbaum is is um, is a is a latent variable in this session because both Stephen was a, a, a student of of uh, Josh's and.